lecture series. Before we begin, would you please check your cell phones and make sure that they're turned to silent. Thank you. It is a distinct pleasure to welcome back to the studio school Jennifer Samet and Paul Resica, who will be in conversation this evening about Mr. Resica's work. Before I turn the evening over to our distinguished guests, I'd like to say a few words about both. Jennifer Samet is a New York-based art historian, curator, and writer. She is professor of art history at the City University of New York and co-directs the gallery Stephen Harvey Fine Art Projects in downtown Manhattan. Samet completed her dissertation at the CUNY Graduate Center on Painterly Representation in New York, 1945 through 1975. Jennifer has lectured at universities across the country on the subject of the role of empathy in art. She has curated major historical exhibitions on the Jane Street Group, the history of the New York Studio School, and reconfiguring the New York School. Her writing on both abstract and representational painting has been published in Master Drawings, Hyperallergic, Artnet Magazine, The New York Sun, and numerous exhibition catalogs. Jennifer Samet is particularly interested in the voice of the artist and has published many interviews with painters, most notably as interviewer at, interviewer at large for Hyperallergic Weekend Edition with her wonderful column, Beer with a Painter. Over his eight decade long career, Paul Resica has exhibited at numerous distinguished venues including Graham Modern, Salander O'Reilly, and the Laurie Bookstein Gallery, which currently represents the artist. His work is included in major public collections throughout the United States, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Museum of Modern Art, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, and the Addison Gallery, among numerous others. He is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, 1984, and has been elected academician at the National Academy of Design, 1978, and the American Academy of Arts and Letters, 1994. Recent exhibitions include Paul Resica, 1947 to 48, um, which was on view September 5th through October 5th at the Laurie Bix Bookstein Gallery. Um, I wanted to mention that this beautiful show was accompanied by a full color catalog with an essay by Karen Wilkin. Mr. Resica's work is presently on view at the National Academy of Art in the exhibition See It Loud, Seven Postwar American, Post American Painters, which is on view through January 26th. 2014. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer Samet and Paul Resica to the podium. Thank you, Pamela, and thank you for all being here. It's an honor and a pleasure. Um, and one of the pleasures of knowing Paul Resica is looking at art with him. He um, began a panel discussion recently with the comment, the reminder that art is inexplicable. And so this makes our work, my work in this case, um, more challenging, more complicated, because there aren't any easy answers or explanations that he's going to provide. But on the other hand, it's, um, it's kind of just a beautiful challenge, a provocation, that comment. Um, and I'm sure that there are many of you here in this room who have had the experience of looking at art uh, with Paul, whether it's at the Met or uh, maybe just standing in front of a few paintings with him at a gallery. Um, so you know what I mean by this beautiful challenge that he gives us because it's really an opportunity to look if he's not going to give us the easy answers and really to match the intensity of his gaze that he has. And um, related to this um, pleasure is the pleasure of seeing the art that is in his own collection and in the home um, that he shares with his wife, Paul Resica, here in New York and on the Cape because they have just a wonderful um, and very personal collection. So 
what we're going to do for you today is instead of actually kind of giving you these the easy answers about his own work, is instead to take a tour um, through their collection, um, work by other artists, and in doing so, kind of give you a glimpse into parts of Paul's own story, his life, as told through the objects, these artworks by other artists in their collection. Okay. So we're going to start here. Um, this is a painting by Saul Wilson, who, um, who was Resica's first art teacher, and he studied with Saul Wilson at age 12 here in New York. Um, so Paul, I'm hoping that you can tell us a little bit about Saul Wilson and your classes with him. Yeah, he taught, uh, he was a, a romantic um, seascape painter, of which there were many at that time in the 1940s in New York. There are not so many now. Uh, there were many there. Among them were uh, Jean Liberty. I don't know if anyone, how many know the name of Liberty? And uh, Matson and uh, uh, the chef de col was Joe DiMartini. They all looked up to him. But all of these people uh, had a, their god was Ryder, uh, Pinkham Ryder. Blake Lock Ryder and uh, Loftus Newman, who were three very beautiful romantic painters. Ryder, you all know, of course, still. But many people, uh, many of the American painters thought he was the great American painter. And it was before the revival of the Hudson River School. Uh, it was generally accepted among painters that Ryder was the great American painter. Now you hardly see his work anywhere. It's a whole different atmosphere, of course, though. Anyhow, I went to study with Wilson uh, in his studio on 16th Street and 6th Avenue. And he would have a, um, a setup of uh, some rocks and a little lighthouse, and <laughs> some sand. And you'd paint the sea. Of course, I never saw the sea. I was a New York kid, but I painted the sea that way. And uh, you, you did still lives also. And I worked with him every Saturday and sometimes Sundays for about three or four years until I more or less, I guess, thought I equaled him and knew everything I could get from him. And then I went on. And now, uh, let's see, we'll show a little example of a picture I did in this school. I don't know what year it was this. Yeah. I think this is um, 1944, so this is a painting of Paul's from that time period. Well, that's probably when I was about to leave him. I painted many pictures more. Anyhow, that's a, it's a tiny picture. My mother, who loved pictures, used to buy uh, little panels in the junk shops of New York with frames, with the, uh, grand frames around them. They usually were Hudson River pictures, and I would paint over them. <laughs> so under here may be a maram of some very valuable work of art. <laughs> it's about this size, this picture. So um, after you studied with Saul Wilson, uh, you were encouraged to uh, take classes with Hans Hoffman. And um, this is a painting by William Fried, who was one of your important friends well, and classmates at Hoffman School. Well, I remember in Saul Wilson's class, there was a, a girl about my age, a little bit older, who had gone to Bennington, I think. Her name was Sonia Rudikoff. She became quite a uh, good critic of painting. I think she's long, long gone. And I remember she was painting in the class, and she began to paint the picture, of the still life, flat. And Sal Wilson was quite annoyed with it. He said, why do you make it so flat? 
Well, she was obviously going somewhere else. And then she told me she was going to the Hoffman School, she said. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, I also at that time knew a woman named, a young woman named Pennington West, who's been forgotten but was an excellent painter. And she was in the circle of, of uh, Lee Krasner and Bob De Niro and Jackson Pollock. And, uh, and she told me to go to Hoffman and arranged for me to go. And I was still in high school when I went to Hoffman. I would go at night. I'd take the A train down from Washington Heights. And uh, I was there every night. And it was right on 8th Street down here, you know. And uh, that was my introduction. And when I came into the school, it was a loft, uh, two flights up. There was a model posing and about six or seven students. That's all there were. It was quite a secret, the Hoffman School. And uh, the first people I saw there was a tiny man about this high uh, who'd been there for 10 years. And then there was a very tall man, very tall man, who had also been there about 10 years. And they knew how to draw in the Hoffman manner of the school. Everybody drew a certain way on a certain size paper. And uh, so Freed also lived uptown. He lived near Columbia. So we would go up on the, on the 8th Avenue subway together at night. And he would explain to me what the great meaning of the Hoffman School was. That was Bill Freed. He's probably been forgotten, but he ended up in Provincetown. He was close to Hoffman for many, many years. And this little picture I bought at an auction in uh, Provincetown Art Association for 50 bucks. And I was so embarrassed because Freed was standing right next to me there. And $50 is what it brought. Of course, it was maybe like 100 now or 200 And uh, so I became one of the people who uh, who canceled the auction of living artists. And no living artist should ever give a picture to an auction. It's a disgrace. It's against the only way you make a living and the only way you can live. The auctioning of artist pictures is a terrible business that all institutions do. Anyhow, that's, uh, that's aside from my career. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Move on. Yeah, move on okay. to Freed. Okay, these are um, two paintings by Seymour Remenick, who was another classmate at the Hoffman School. And after he studied with Hoffman, he moved um, back to Philadelphia and was known for his plein air paintings of um, the outskirts of Philadelphia, like you're seeing on the right. Um, and I. I know that you said about um, Remenick, atmosphere in landscape painting, missing for a hundred years, eclipsed by impressionism and modern art, was Remenick's gift to us. Well, I said I must. Have, I wrote that sometimes, <laughs> you must have said but that. <laughs> I should, I shouldn't have said it. But I said it. At any rate, that's a self-portrait by Remenick. But at that time, of course, he didn't paint like that. We were all students of Hoffman in Provincetown or in New York. And, uh, but I had some friends right away uh, uh, who became my lifelong friends, uh, or frenemies, as Caldas used to say. <laughs> and uh, among them were Paul Georges and Remenick and uh, Howard Daum. I don't know if you know these names, but I will show pictures by all of them. Uh, of course, this is a late picture of Remenix. Um, anyway, I own these pictures and I look at them often. Next, let's go on. Okay, so um, this is actually the Paul Georges that's in Russica's collection, a still life. This is a tiny picture about this big, but it shows his hand, and his terrific hand, if you could see it. Yeah. 
The knife, what a splendid knife. Huh? Yeah. That's it. There are many pictures you know, up at the answers. academy. Yeah. Well, there you are. <laughs> Did you want to share anything about, um, you know, Georges was a lifelong friend. Yeah. Some of the things that you talked about over the years. Hmm. No, I have nothing to say. <laughs> well, there are many of his pictures at the Academy. You can see, you can, there's so many of his pictures there. You might, only, you might think there are too many of his pictures there. Uh, you really get a good dose of George's if you go to that show. There's some great pictures there. You'll be quite astounded by some of them, yeah. Yeah. Well, we both made uh, the move early in the 50s to leave in the 40s and 50s. We knew that, uh, or we thought, that the great coming of abstract expressionism, that's a word no one ever used, by the way. It's a contradiction in terms. Uh, but uh, we knew that it had already, it was already over as far as we were concerned. And indeed, in a certain way, it was, I still think. I think the height is Pollock's pictures in 1950, two, three, four, the totems, and I saw one picture at Sotheby's last year that he painted just before he began the drips. I thought it was the best picture he ever painted. At any rate, let's go on. Okay, okay so. Um this is a piece by Howard Daum. Yeah, no, this is Daum, D-A-U-M. He lived on 14th Street uh, at number 30 East, which is a studio building. It still is, I think. Kuniyoshi had a studio there, and Dickinson. And Daum lived a miserable life in a tiny room. He didn't even have a shower. He was... Uh, my mother, who was Russian, of course, said he was nischasnya. And nischasnya meaning a person who really, <laughs> you can't help him in any way. He can't help himself. But he was a great artist, a great, a real artist, one of the best I ever knew. I met him in Provincetown. I was riding my bicycle back from the beach. And I saw a man, uh, you know, with no shirt on, beet red, the most terrifying red you ever saw. And I stopped, I said, are you a Dom, the artist? He said, yes, I'm Dom, and he was burned to death. He had never been out of New York. <laughs> and this was his only time, by the way, he never went again. So I became friends with him, and he, and he moved in with me in my studio, which was right across from the church at 350 Commercial Street, if you know Provincetown. Now there are about 15 shops in that studio. Gottlieb was my neighbor, by the way, in that, st in that studio. Uh, Adolf Gottlieb, that is. And this is the church looking at it. And you can see it's painted, so it's drawn very much like a Hoffman. Mm -hmm. Because Daum had been, uh, maybe he'd studied with Hoffman, but really he was a student of Vaclav Wittlitschil. Does that name mean anything? Yeah, he, was taught, he taught the Hoffman method, you might say, or the Hoffman way at the Art Students League for 50 years. He was the apostle of Hoffman. Although when Hoffman arrived here, he eclipsed him. That's often what happens. But uh, anyhow, you could, this really looks like a Wittler chill or, you know, anyhow. I also have in my, I, I also bought this wonderful picture from him, made it 20 years later, at the height of his powers. Terrific picture, which I hang in, which hangs in my house. Big picture this is, I'd say about 40 inches, more 40, 40, 50 inches across. Yeah. Dom used to say, composition was the abacus. That's all you needed was the abacus, in other words, mm -hmm. You know, up and down, this way and that way. Positions. You understand that? Someone here understands that. 
You who are painters understand that. Mm. The abacus is all he cared about. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Mm. He died a miserable death, of course, in some insane, in uh, Bellevue Hospital. He loved operations, too. They could get him to do anything. <laughs> go ahead. Let's go. D-A-U-M, great painter. Okay, so these are um, two paintings by Ressica from the 1940s on the left, Motor Shop, and on the right, Subway. And, um, That's, sorry, did I'll you want to say something? The Subway has the, those, those yellow things in the Subway are chewing gum machines, in case you, for the young people here who never saw a chewing gum machine in the Subway. <laughs> That's what they are. The one on the left is a huge picture. It's my granica, you might say. It's the motor shop of my father. He was, uh, my father was a great man to me. He supported me, which is very important to an artist. And though he didn't love painting, which is even more interesting. <laughs> Go ahead. So I had an easy life, unlike my friends around whose hands are like sandpaper. Yeah. So this is another painting oh, of Brassicas. This from is the little, 40s. Bo, little Bo Peep. This is my favorite Picasso-esque picture of that time. Yeah. So after you made those paintings that we just looked at, you went to Europe and um, ended up living in Venice, where you apprenticed for an American painter, Edward Melkarth, um, who was making social realist paintings in a Baroque style. And this is um, Paul's painting, Flower Carriers of the Judeca. <laughs> this is a huge painting. Like a, I tried to paint it like a Tintoretto. As you can see, I did flour and coal and wood and wine. This is what they used to carry out in front of my house. But it's very, I mean, there were years in between. I went to Paris, like everyone did if they had a chance to find out about painting. And like everyone else, I, I went to see uh, Giotto or Piero della Francesca. I remember when I went to the Louvre, the picture I loved most was San Agricole and the Donner, which was a, uh, a picture from the Avignon School, which shows where my mind was. In other words, I was a modern painter. I wouldn't think of looking at Veronese or anyone like that. But uh, by going to Venice, uh, I slowly began to see the great Venetian painters. And so this wasn't painted right the next day after those other pictures. It was about five years later or so, or more. Go on. This is a painting by Aristodemus Caldus that's in um, Paul's collection, and you met Caldus in Rome, is that right? Yeah, I was walking, I, I lived in Rome after Venice, and I was walking along the Corso, and I saw an extraordinary looking man with two scarves and great hair on his nose and powerful looking characters surrounded by a lot of people under a lamp post. Mm -hmm. And I recognized him because he had been in, in New York and among all the painters, and he had given a lecture that I attended. And I didn't know what the hell he was talking about in that lecture. It seemed insane to me. Anyhow, I saw him then, and I began to talk to him. And uh, he came back to me with a little studio I had down the street, and he came up, and he looked at my Venetian pictures, uh, portraits and various things, and he said to me, Boy, you will win a prize. I took it as a compliment, but it was not meant that way. <laughs> Anyhow, we became great friends, Galdis and I. 
It was one of the things that united me and Paul George as we were like his nephews, you might say. And Caldas was a great figure in New York. As he, when he gave his lectures, Bill de Koenig carried the slide projector. I'll give you an idea of, the, of, of who he was. He was a free spirit. Uh, these are two of your portraits that you made um, after you came back to New York and lived on Washington Square North. And so on the left actually is a portrait of Howard Dow. And you'll have to remind me that um, portrait on the right. His name was Jock Beckwith. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, uh, if he's known at all as a painter. I think he became a carpenter and lived up in Cornwall. But Daum, as you can see, had that beautiful nose. But then the doctors persuaded him to have some operation, and they made a very <laughs> ugly nose. <laughs> yeah, well, that's just Daum, of course. Yeah. Too bad there's no one here who knows him. He was always between the park and, and uh, 14th Street on University Place. He never went in the Cedar Bar. Bars were not for him. He would play chess in the park, eat at Smith's, which was a ghastly place to eat. Yeah, that was dumb. Yeah, that's a good portrait. That's very small, by the way. They're both small. Anyhow, that's how I was painting in the 50s in, in New York. Yeah. So this is a painting in your collection by David Grossblatt, um, who you said owned the um, cafe Rienzo. Rienzi, he, he made the first cafe in the village. Uh, there were a lot of coffee shops in the village in those days. Uh, originally there was only one Italian coffee shop on McDougal Street, then many opened up. And there were painters who went to the bars and painters who went to the coffee shops. If you like girls, you usually went to the coffee shops. Uh, if you want to make your career, you went to the bar. At any rate, uh, I used to go to the coffee shops with, uh, <laughs> with, uh, with a friend of mine named Friedel Zubas, who became an ab abstract painter, became quite well known. And the Rienzi Cafe was opened by uh, a group of people, among them David Grossblatt. And uh, I thought he was a terrific painter. And he painted when uh, he died young at 60. Uh, Paul Georges and I, uh, together with Bruce Gagne, who was then the head of the studio school, put on a, a big show of his in the gallery here. It was the most marvelous exhibition. I don't know if there are any photographs of it or anything. Mm -hmm. But his work, of course his work disappeared. I bought this one and the poet Samuel Manasha bought another. And otherwise, they eventually were taken to the West Coast by his daughter and then taken to the dump. And in the dump, some dealer found a few of them, and I hear they were online somewhere, some of them. You know. Anyhow, I own this big, it's a big, very big picture of cats. It's all cats, as you can see. There's the young girl with the cat, and, and this wonderful puppet here on the right, dressed this great puppet, and then all these other cats. Can you see all those cats? They're all over the place. Mm -hmm. If you like cats, it's a nice thing to look at. <laughs> go ahead, next, go ahead, okay. let's go. So this is your painting um, that's called Visitation. And maybe you want to tell us about um, the models for this That's painting. David Grossblatt sitting on the left. <laughs> and that's a, uh, as you can see, is a garage in, out in East Hampton, out in Springs. You can tell from the, from the sh uh, shingles, I think. And that's his big painting. And that's his wife posing for him. She was a great beauty but a terrible shrew. 
At any rate, that's my painting of her. And um, <laughs> I bought it back after he died from, from uh, his wife. I bought it. And it's one of my favorite pictures, sort of Georgian-esque picture. Uh, it's 58, I believe, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is this painting is actually here in the room on the easel. Um, this is Resica's painting um, from the Ramapo River area in New Jersey, um, Oakland. And maybe you can tell us um, about how you started painting out there. Well, I painted. Well, first I began there with the, when I was teaching at the Cooper Union. I taught the landscape class. I we go out for a week with the kids. And uh, they paint landscape, and it was a beautiful thing to do, actually, in the, in the spring and in, in the fall and in the spring. So I began to see that part of the world. And then at one point, uh, my wife and I rented a shack in the Ramapo Mountains, which, is, which are only uh, 35 miles from New York, but it's, it's a completely wild place. It might still be as wild as it was. Extraordinary. I could get my coffee at, uh, here in, uh, on Broadway, put it in the car, and be in this wild place, and the coffee was still hot, and I'd be painting next to, on the river bank with not a soul in sight. Yeah. Anyhow, I made many paintings of the Ramapo River, and I also painted all over New Jersey in the um, out past, what's that, Warwick, out past there where they used to have dairy farms. And that brings me, I was once painting in a field. Can I tell this story now? Yeah. I was painting in a field there. Uh, and the dairy farmer came up to me, he said, oh, he said, you ought, to, you ought to go see Rube down the road. He's an artist too. Well, you know who that was? Reuben Kadish. He had a dairy farm. Does that name ring a bell? Reuben oh, yeah. Kadish somewhere? Yeah. He had come here with Pollock and Gustin. They were both all three high school students at the Manual Arts High School in Los Angeles. And uh, Kadish uh, uh, got, went to a dairy farm instead of making a career as an artist. Although later on he came to New York and taught. But um, I bought this at an auction, for, not for much money. I bought it because I loved Kadish. And I have some other little things by him. He was a wonderful man. I didn't buy it because I thought it was great. But I've had it for about 20, over 20 years. And now I think it's great. So it shows you don't always know what a thing is. And that's the great thing about uh, owning a work of art or having it. And this thing sits outside of my house up on the Cape. And look at how look what a thing. I don't know if you can see it, but it's a great it's a great thing. It's about f four feet high, I'd say. Ruben Kadish. Yeah. So these are two of Resica's landscape paintings, and he continued to make landscape paintings in the seventies. Um, in Mexico and in Provence. So the painting on the right is um, from Mexico, right? And on the left from, um, from Vaucluse. It's a town called uh, La Coste. In, in, uh, in the Vaucluse, yes. <clears throat> and the Vaucluse was, uh, it's, it's a fantastic part of France if you've never been there. You know, it's the only place you don't miss the sea. And there's no sea, but it's all rocks and fantastic landscape. Lavender and you know, great landscape. And this is an old house that was there. I painted for many, painted a great deal. So it was in um, those years that you started showing with Peridot Gallery and 
Rosemary Beck um, was another painter who showed at the Peridot Gallery. So this is a small, um, this is an oil on paper, right? By yeah. Rosemary Beck. Yeah. Embarkation for somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> it's Rosemary painting a little like me. Actually, uh, Rosemary's figure paintings are more her, what she's known for and where she put most of her efforts in to, but she lived on 12th Street, so we would draw together. We had a couple that would pose for us, and we would draw. Oh, here's some drawings. Jen, Jen tells me that the top one is by her and the bottom one is by me, but I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She taught here, you know, and she was a, a great friend of uh, Mercedes. So you drew these models together for a couple of years? Yeah, so. yeah, mm -hmm. till they f fell out of love. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't screwing or anything, it was <laughs> nothing like that. Next, in those days you didn't do those things in public, <laughs> except in Roman times, go ahead, and that's what's next. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So next is a painting by Peter Heinemann. This isn't exactly the one that's in your collection, but something um, similar, a self-portrait head by Peter Heinemann. And maybe you can tell us about how you met Well, Peter. Peter, li Peter lived on 8th Street. I lived in Washington Square North, and my, I used to go out on the Mews there. So we were half a block from each other, and each of us was half a block from the Cedar Bar and from the Rikers, and Rikers was a coffee place where just as significant as the Cedars. It's where people went after the Cedar or for breakfast in the morning. So I knew him very well. He was right in this neighborhood. And I'd heard of him when I was very early on because he, I'd heard he was this terrific 18-year-old kid who could paint terrific portraits. And indeed, I saw some at the Rocco Gallery, which was a gallery that's disappeared, and they were extraordinary portraits. He was a solitary character who taught the foundation class at the Visual School of Visual Arts for 50 years, from its first day until the day he died, practically. And he didn't show for many, many years. He was a solitary, terrific character, and did heads for 20 years, just heads of himself. And there, uh, there's nothing harder than to do a head, as you know. Well, except to put a head on a figure would be even harder. <laughs> uh, but uh, no one can do that. <laughs> except maybe Picasso, and he knew how hard it was to do. Even Baltus can't really do it. Anyhow, that's, uh, I have so many paintings that I buy. And by the way, I have a lot of paintings by uh, contemporary painters, but I'm not showing anyone who's alive, so that, don't be jealous of that. But um, I have so many paintings, and when we moved from a big house to a smaller, big apartment to a smaller apartment, I had to stack them in my studio. And so I can't find my great portrait by Heinemann for some reason. That's why we <laughs> have to use this one, you know, which is a great one, too. What power that head has. Huh? Mm -hmm. Anyhow, there's a whole room of his up at the uh, academy now. You ought to look at it. It's amazing, absolutely amazing room. Yep. It reminded me very much of of <clears throat> Leland Bell, who's hanging right next door, and very beautifully hung, too. In both these cases, there are not too many pictures. Um, and I once <clears throat> said to Heinemann that he had some of the tones in his picture reminded me of Leland. He almost killed me for that. <laughs> so it's hard to, hard to unite painters, you know? Very hard. You could see connections, but they don't see it at all. Next. Let's go. Okay. So we're going to look at 
a few of Paul's paintings from the 80s now um, when you were showing at Graham Gallery. Go ahead. And you started um, painting the Provincetown Pier or made this your subject matter. This is up at the Academy now. Yes. That's painted in the 80s sometime. It's a big picture. Yeah, go on. This is another um, Provincetown Pier painting from the 80s. So this is a photograph of your desk in um, your apartment in New York. And um, maybe you can tell us about what we're looking at here. Uh, the top is a Duran, Andre Duran. And uh, below it is a rider. Albert Pinkham Ryder. It's a sketch for the um, Rhine Maidens. And the top is a Duran from the 1920s, around 1922. On the bottom right is George Spaventa, who taught here for many years. I've got a lot of his sculptures and drawings. And uh, in the middle, is Agostini, the little horse, Peter Agostini. And the other two are by living people. I won't mention who they are. <laughs> We're going to look at them <laughs> in more detail, detail here. So here's the rider painting that you acquired in those years when you were showing at Graham Gallery through your dealer, Berta Walker. Oh, yeah. Berta Walker was my dealer at Graham, and she was the daughter of Hudson Walker. And uh, that's the Walker family from Min Minneapolis, and Walker Arts Center, et cetera. And she thought, uh, she fell in love with my pictures, and uh, so I would make exchanges with her for painters she thought I should have. So I had this writer, which is very unusual to own one. You know, I have the Hartley from her, too. There it is. There it is. I have this Hartley next to a window, and you couldn't. You can only see it in, in the morning, gray light. Otherwise, you can't see it at all. It's so dark, and it, but it's a beautiful picture too. Marsden Hartley, right? Maybe you can share some of your um, thoughts, your interest in these two American painters, Ryder and Hartley. Well, the first story that comes to mind about Hartley was told me by a, a painter, an old painter in, the, in a studio on 55th Street. His name was Blatas. And Blatas was famous for painting portraits of everyone in the, in, the, in the School of Paris. In other words, he did everyone, Picasso, Brock, you know, uh, Soutine, et cetera, et cetera. He wasn't such a great painter, but anyhow, that's what he did. And he, he, and he had a beautiful ring on his finger. I said, how'd you get that ring, Blattis? He says, well, Hartley gave me this. Marsden Hartley gave me this ring. I said, indeed? What? He said, yes, I used to sit with him in the automat on 57th Street. And when he'd see a young policeman on a horse, he'd say, ah, that's great art for you. <laughs> <laughs> he was gay, Hartley, as you know. Go on. He liked young policemen on horses. <laughs> you know, he's a great painter, by the way. We're talking about painting, or you know, it's a different thing. All these stories about painters, they don't mean anything. And nor does anything you ever say about painting, nor does it mean anything, as you know. The reason I brought that little picture here and put it there is because it's all nonsense to talk about pictures. And you have to look at a picture, and that's the point of having a collection of pictures and the point of having a real picture there. That's all it is. It's a humble and great thing, like someone said about Pizarro, humble and colossal. This is a sculpture that's in your home on the Cape um, by a sculptor named Trajan. Torku, Torku Trajan, or Trojan, as he called himself. I never knew him. It's from the, he was, worked in the 30s in New York. 
and uh, many people think he's uh, our greatest sculptor. Some people think Lipschitz, some people think others. Uh, in the basement of the new school, they used to have about 10 of them. I owned one of them. And uh, Howard Kalish owns one out in, out in uh, Williamsburg. Terrific one. This is a terrific, uh, it's an extraordinary thing. This is what taught me about sculpture. I'd say owning this taught me what sculpture was, as much as I know, which is not much, since I'm no sculptor. But uh, when I, I bought it at an auction of the Chrysler Museum, and uh, I got it for about 300 bucks. Nobody wanted it but me. And uh, I, when I bought it, I was going to break the arms off, because I thought, what are these skinny arms doing on this thing? <laughs> it's good I didn't do it. <laughs> That's what I learned about sculpture from this thing. It's an androgynous figure. And like a Greek thing from the early days. It's big, too. It's not the size of it. It's like a Tanagra, but it's huge. I mean, it's big. And it's a great thing. I don't know if you can see it in the slide or not. But you can see the connection to Spaventa, right? If you know Spaventa, how many know the work of Spaventa here? Skip to that. Oh, oh we're going to have some. Oh, yeah, by all means. Here are two Spaventas, yeah. Look at them, huh? My wife doesn't like ugly art, but she allows these in the house. <laughs> and I like ugly art as well as beautiful art. I mean, the. the, the she doesn't like the terribilita. I think you said Spavento was um, one of on the founding faculty of the studio school here. Yeah. And um, and Agostini also taught here at the studio school. And before he made these sculptures of horses, um, he made plaster sculptures called swells that were related to pop art. Yes, he used to cast balloons and things, and so he had a great moment in the art world by doing that. But he was always good, no matter what he did. Yeah. Yeah. So you knew Agostini and uh, Spaventa, but not Trajan, uh, right? No, I never knew Trajan. And Agostini I knew, but Spaventa I knew in a, in a nicer way, uh, because he was a a big figure among the abstract painters. He'd always be sitting in the Cedar Bar. And there were many great stories about him. He never spoke. He was very good looking. And one day, I went into some luncheonette there on 8th Street, and Spaventa said, sit here. And that was a great moment in my life. So it was a being received into a certain company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They say about Spaventa, they tell a story about Spaventa. He was sitting in the seat of bar and his, who was his girlfriend? Who was the painter out there? Oh, I can't tell, I can't get the wrong person. Anyhow, she was having an affair with, uh, he heard she was having an affair with someone out in East Hampton. So he took a cab out to East Hampton, knocked on the door, hit the guy once in the jaw, took the cab back, and was at the Cedar Bar, at the same place he was. That's the story they used to tell about George Paventa. What happened to us? We lost the... We're having some technical uh, problems, well, That's apparently. all right, that's all right. That's, <laughs> we could go on and talk about other things. We could take some questions now while we're waiting for this to go back on. Yes? <laughs> well, there's someone who really knows the right thing to ask. <laughs> More or less all my life. But it didn't support me. With, uh, it wasn't real. It wasn't like a lot of money, but enough to carry me over, in other words. Just enough to carry me over, so I wasn't poor. 
I say just, uh, yeah. Are the mics on? Yes. The mics are on. Okay. <laughs> yes. I don't know what happened to his pictures, no. The enormous ones. He had, uh, yes, he had a big picture also. I remember two, yes, he had two pictures up there, it's true. I don't know, I don't know what happened, no. Did you want to go on? So this is a Milton Resnick that's in um, Paul's studio right now. Yeah, this is one of the ugly pictures my wife won't allow in the house. But I love it. It's a terrific picture, I think. It reminds me of a Delacroix. After Milton Resnick died, the estate told me I was, being a friend of his, I was invited to come and choose a picture from the estate. There was some tax reason to do this, I guess. And uh, those who were friends certain, of a certain level went, got works on paper. If you were another level, you, got a, you went to another floor. There were many floors. He had a synagogue, you know, with many floors. And it's going to be a museum one day to his work. And Milton was, uh, I think, a very fine, a very good painter. You know, very moving and good to me. And when I would paint little landscapes in the days when, you, when no one was painting landscapes, by the way, it's hard to believe that no one was painting landscapes, but it was so. Uh, Milton and Pat would always come to my shows. It was a, he was from another school. In other words, there was no party line among painters. It was, uh, the party line was made by schools and by critics, or by God knows, but by the business end, by the dealers. There was no party line at all. De Kooning bought a picture of mine, for example, which had nothing to do with, it was completely out of another period entirely. So anyhow, this is Resnick, reminds me of a Delacroix. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the subject is. I suppose something terrifying. <laughs> it's a dark picture about uh, 24 by 36 inches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is the Duran that we were looking at in the photograph of your desk. Um, and maybe you can talk about why Duran is important to you. Mm -hmm. Well, Duran is one of the great people who refused modern art in a certain way, or refused the Dada, the Duchamp side of modern art. Uh, which took, uh, which many people did. Um, and all of us in our group up there at the academy, I suppose, did. I suppose Baltus is a good example of it. But Duran was a better painter than most <laughs> who do this. You know, this is a beautiful picture. What can you say about it? I have another Duran. I have several drawings by Duran, too. Yeah. It's about this big. And this is a pretty good reproduction of it, too. Andre Duran, if anyone doesn't, my pronunciation may not be so hot. You know who I mean, right? Yeah. yeah. So this is one of your paintings um, from about 2000 called Prado from uh, your Vessels series. It's one of, my, one of my best pictures, I think. Big picture, very big picture. And 
found another painting from around that same time called Sisters, 2001. Yeah, I don't know which sisters these are. I think it's Elizabeth and Sonia outside. Yeah, go on. And a painting from a few years, years later um, from Jack's Island in Maine from about 2006. What we say is from Jack's, it's, it's painted, inspired by having gone to Maine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It doesn't look like Maine much, does it? No. <laughs> This is a painting by De Martini, who you mentioned in oh, the yeah. very beginning yeah, now we're, of our talk. Yeah, Joe De Martini, who was the, as I said, the chief of the seascape painters, of the romantic seascape painters, had a great change that came over him in midlife. He had a great success. He was the most successful painter, too, of that. His pictures were at every museum in the country, although now they're deaccessioned, I'm sure. Um, but Matisse, he was converted by Matisse uh, to uh, become an Italian metaphysical painter. And he, uh, the story is he went to Paris and stayed four days at the great Matisse show, which I think was in, was it 50? Does anyone know when it was? Sometime around then, 40s, late 40s or 50. And he stayed four days and came back, and that was the great change in his life. And he painted these metaphysical pictures, of which I own many. I think he's the most, they're the most extraordinary, very Italian and very mysterious pictures. Yeah. Yeah. He lived on, uh, his studio was on 15th Street and 5th Avenue, which was an old studio building. There were many studio buildings in New York, you know. And not so many now. And many painters had studios and studio buildings all over the place. So it was a different atmosphere. There was such a thing as studio buildings. It's even the time before lofts, if you can imagine such a thing. Yeah. And this is your painting from 2009, um, which you titled sales for D. Martini. Yeah, it reminds me of a D. Martini. Go back and let's see if there's any connection. <laughs> well, it doesn't, it's blue anyhow. <laughs> well, anyhow, no, not much connection, but good, but go back and see what my, no, put my, on. yeah. Is it something to do with the geometry? Or Maybe. The Metaphysical well, my feeling. pictures were getting very geometrical, but now they're less geometrical. I'm giving, giving up on geometry. <laughs> well, there's always a geometry in painting, as we know. I mean, naturally. But the abacus is much better. It tells you much more than geometry. Go on, let's go. That's the end. Is that the end? Oh, well, oh. that's the end. <laughs> I, g I gave a talk here about 15 years ago, and Lee Morse was an excellent woman, has a gallery uptown, where Leonard Anderson has a show right now, by the way, um, said, it's the best lecture I ever went to. I was home at 8.30. <laughs> and she lived far away. <laughs> Okay. Did you want to take more questions, Paul? Sure. If there's any questions. Okay. Can we please um, see who he points to? Did you point to the man in the back? Yeah, yeah. in the back. Hello, Paul. Uh, do you recall by any chance uh, the first time you thought you'd be a painter and uh, what the reason was for it? Yes, my mother loved painting. And uh, I'm probably the first of the generation of children who painted. You know, children were not, never painted. 
Wren was supposed to have said, what sort of thing is that to give a child when someone was carrying a paint box to their child? Uh, it's a new thing. Now every child paints, of course, part of school. Every, there's no child who doesn't paint and no mother who doesn't have her child's paintings up on the uh, icebox or refrigerator <laughs> everywhere. But my mother loved pictures. Uh, yeah, she loved pictures. And so sent me to uh, every kind of art school there ever was. I went to art school on 4 14th Street, the American Artist School. And uh, I took the children's classes there. And I, it was the communist school. It was not the, uh, it was uh, the rival of the Art Students League. Milton Resnick ran the elevator. He was 10 years older than me. He told me later on that he ran the elevator when I was in that school. <laughs> and, uh, and Francis Chris taught there. And it was Francis Chris's class that I took over at the visual arts school one year. So the whole thing, I'm trying to show you how it all connects. Everybody connects. Yep. And so you too connect, I'm sure you'll find out how. Anyhow, that's the answer. My mother uh, sent me to these places. And then uh, we lived on 140th Street on Convent Avenue. And there was a big Hebrew orphan asylum up there, a ghastly Victorian building, very beautiful, I'd say now, but very f intimidating then. And there was a WPA art class there. And I went there and painted in oil paints. You could go right in and paint in oil. Right there, there was all set up for you. So I painted, that was, must have been 10 or 11 years old. And, uh, yep, that's the answer to that, yeah. Um, I wanted to know, you used the words metaphysical and you talked about a synagogue that could become a museum. And I wonder what it is that, after all this painting, what you believe may be related to it, um, if that's a respectful enough question. Um. Uh, about the synagogue and the... Yeah, you, keep, you keep mentioning these words that... Oh, yeah, oh, 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 I see, yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. They're, they're words, yeah. Well, I'm not a writer, you know, and I don't take words that seriously, but I do know what a synagogue is, and I do know what... Do I know what metaphysical is? Somehow more than the physical. Uh, so there is a spiritual thing about it, right, that you feel. Well, there's a Chagall show now uptown uh, at the Jewish Museum. It's a, a very bad uh, hanging with all sorts of schmaltzy remarks by everybody. You know what schmaltz is, everybody here? <laughs> And, uh, but the pictures are glorious, absolutely glorious, glorious pictures. Yeah, don't miss it. But you have to go Thursday night, I think it's not so crowded. Uh, yeah, but it'd probably be crowded. Yeah. And as far as uh, the synagogue, it's, I only mention that because um, Milton Resnick owned a synagogue and lived in one. And they're turning, the estate is turning it into a museum for him. He lived on the top floor. And he painted on all the floors and filled it with paintings. Yeah. Now, I don't know if Milton had any religion in him at all. I don't know. Except the religion of painting, which we share. I think that was our, our religion that mm -hmm. united us. And I suppose it unites most people here, though, I imagine. I mean, painting is a thing. You don't have to love it. There's no reason to get anything from it. You might love music. You might love other things, poetry. You might love no art at all. You might love football. You might love movies. Well, I don't love movies, and I don't go to movies. I'd rather look at pictures. Now, I take it there are many people here who would rather look at pictures than movies. Not many, I bet there are some here, let me put it that way. And those are the only ones I'm talking to. 
If you'd rather go to the movies, you're someone else. It's perfectly all right. And most people would rather go to the movies. Yeah, that's perfectly all right. <laughs> but there's some, some want pictures, some people are mad about painting. And those are the only people that I can talk to, and that's the only people I paint for. And it doesn't matter if the person has culture or not. There's nothing to do with having any culture if you like painting. You could be a, the coarsest man in the world, or woman in the world, the most vulgar person, but you have a feeling for painting. And that's that. That's the only one that will understand painting. If you don't have that, you don't, I mean, that's all it is. That's painting. We know that's painting. <laughs> Yeah. I was just curious if there was one painting that you could name from another century that if someone said to you, this was the only painting you could take. Oh, absolutely. You. I have it right away. You don't have to go on. <laughs> it's a picture by El Greco in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's a self-portrait. It used to be called Portrait of a Jew, then it was called Portrait of an Old Man. It used to be doubtful. Whatever it is, it's a small painting in the Metropolitan I Museum. The painting, and that's my, one what? Of my I know the painting, and that's one of my favorite yeah, rooms. Well, in that's the, the painting I would want. Yeah, the second one would be the, uh, the uh, viaduct of Cezanne. And the third would be the Venus and the Donners of Titian. See, I can tell you, I can give it right down. You want a hundred? No, no, I only asked for one. <laughs> I drew that many times, about a thousand times. It's very hard to draw it. Mm. But it's hard to draw anything, uh, as you all must know, if you draw. I think there was a question in the front row. Yes? Thank you for the talk. Um, I do love to look at pictures, and I, I love this landscape. Can you tell us again how many years you did it, and uh, uh, is it available, and how much? <laughs> no, you, I've got many pictures like it, but this particular one you can't have, no. How much? I'm not going to go into that. But. Uh, uh, I have many pictures. As a matter of fact, uh, some people, I, I remember Gagne, that's my best period of my painting, he once told me. It's the 1970s. I've got many of them. I never could sell any of them. No, maybe, maybe one or two or three over the years. But uh, no one ever went for them. Maybe it's that New Jersey. People don't like New Jersey. Right? <laughs> they don't believe in New Jersey. <laughs> I have many of those pictures. One day I'll make a show of the, of the New Jersey pictures, yeah, of the Ramapo pictures, yeah. I love this picture, it's in my house, yeah. Yeah, we brought it down here, yeah, right. I'm glad you like it. Would you, be, would you be able to tell us a little bit about the alliance or the figurative alliance and what happened there? <laughs> uh, it was a very contentious place. Um, but many painters went there uh, yeah, on Friday nights. Many of them were there, yes. Leland even came sometimes, but he didn't like it much. But Leland didn't like the academy either. He refused uh, membership there, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. But he's hanging very beautifully there now. Yeah. <laughs> very beautifully, yeah. No, I don't want to talk about it, if you don't mind. Yeah. <laughs> back there. Thanks. Uh, I'm curious, uh, I saw some paintings up, uptown there that were, you, were done in Jamaica, uh, West Indies, 
And I'm curious about what brought you there and how, how did you do the paintings there? I, no, I, I only went once there. There's a connection between Provincetown and Jamaica. Uh, it's a curious connection. Uh, but the many Jamaicans work there and then they settle there and then people from Provincetown go to Jamaica and one of my kids goes there every year and, and uh, loves it. And I went once and looked at it. It's a very dramatic and beautiful place. But I didn't paint that big picture in Jamaica. I painted it back in New York. And I, I made a lot of sketches there and a lot of little, I was only there for five days and made made a, maybe a hundred little little gouaches or 50 and made another 50 on my table in New York when I came back. Sometimes you can do that if you have, if the motif is exciting enough, if you see the forms, you can do it quickly and it's a good thing. And the painting I made from it, I don't know. You like that painting? Uh, yeah. Oh, thank you. I'm in Jamaica, and I uh, really identified with the painting. Yeah. Well, that painting, it's from Treasure Beach, which is on the south, the south, south coast. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's a very primitive part. Very, very beautiful. Fantastic sea. And the people still go down in their boats out, out to fish, and they prepare the nets in the same way they did for so long. It's amazing. Yeah. It's a beautiful place. But there's no painting down there. Yes, uh, thank you. You spoke so beautifully about your early studies uh, as a boy in the different places that you, you painted and drew. Uh, could you speak a little bit about your experience with, uh, with Hoffman as a teacher and what res still resonates with you the most from your days as a student with him? Well, I've given, I've, uh, I've given quite a, written about it, or, or given interviews about it quite a bit. He's a, uh, I hate to repeat myself, but Huffman was, a, and it was an academy. And there was no self-expression. It was no, uh, not finding yourself. Uh, you were learning the principles of painting, according to Huffman, which was based on certain Germanic ideas of Hildebrand, uh, of sort of basically it's to make the thing alive and not disappear. Like academic painting disappears. Most painting just disappears. This painting stays, uh, let's say it stays on the surface. That's just like Basel Relievo, you say. It's close. It's full of tensions. It's hard to say what it is. The word we used was plasticity, the plastic imagination. I don't know if, it, if this resonates with anyone anymore, these words. Uh, but I think Hoffman taught, yeah, he was a great teacher of, of all the things you need to know to be a painter, yes. Except he wouldn't teach you anything of the academic uh, school. You learned no anatomy there. And if you wanted anything like that, you had to go elsewhere. And when I, I was a kid there, so naturally, uh, I wanted more than he gave me. I didn't think he was giving me all the, telling me all the real secrets. <laughs> but I was very young, of course. I was one of his stars there, you see. Early on, there'd been another star, uh, Bob De Niro. He also went at the age of 17 or 18. And so Bob was always a hero of mine because he'd been there before me. That's how it always is. He'd been there five years before me. You all know the paintings of Bob De Niro? Yeah, well, he's the father of the actor. And uh, I always loved his pictures. And, um, hmm. But to say what Huffman taught, it's hard to say now in words what he taught. Yeah. There's another question here. Um, what have your habits with working from observation versus working otherwise? Uh -huh. 
for imagination or from the picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I don't work from nature hardly at all anymore. I I work mostly from my head. Uh, well, I had bad eyes for a while. Now I've had an operation and it's now much better. So I may start working from nature a bit. Who knows? I don't know. It's uh, it's quite different. When you work from nature, you work quickly. It's always fresh. If you, uh, you, you know, first things are always the best anyhow, in everything, in most things. First things are the best. You can never do that again. So when you make a thing from nature, it's a terrific, yeah. But to work from your mind is something too. If you have a mind, you gotta have a mind. You know? <laughs> And I don't know if I have a mind for it, but I could answer about Hoffman. I thought of something that Wittlitschel said. Uh, he said, you know how when you draw a figure on a page, there's blank space on each side of the figure, right? You've all drawn figures, right? Standing up, right? You know the blank space on either side? Well, Wittlitschel said, those are the wings. He said, Hoffman took away the wings. So that's the point. So when you see a drawing of Michelangelo, even if it's a fragment, it expands in some plastic way. Even though it's a bombastic art, and Hoffman had some bombast in him too, by the way. He loved Michelangelo's drawings. Yeah. But he loved all real good painting. And of course he had a high culture, which was another thing that Hoffman gave you. You knew you were with someone who had a great culture, whether he taught you anatomy or not. And also you could see that he knew anatomy. That was another interesting thing about Hoffman when he drew. Oh, of course he drew on your drawing. I should say that, you must understand that. There was nothing sacri sacred about your drawing. Hoffman would draw on it to show you how to do it. And often you see exhibitions now of Hoffman students, and they show these drawings, which are really done by Hoffman. The only thing good in them are the touches of Hoffman. That would be funny. And they don't even say that this is a Hoffman drawing. They say it's their drawing. Very funny to see, if you know it. Yeah. But there are exceptions. He had great students who drew beautifully, like Hoffman. Lee Krasner, for example, or De Niro, or, or uh, well, those are the two best that come to mind right now, but there are many, many people studied with him and drew very well, yeah, in the plastic way. Now, Mercedes, of course, came out of that, but she made it into a kind of school where it was more, where it was really that you couldn't achieve anything. It was a matter of just keep, keep worrying it to death. But it was a good idea in some way to worry it to death because unless you work on the thing, you'll never know about the thing. So to obliterate a picture is also good. But I don't think to worry it to death is so hot. But to obliterate it is very important, to take it out. And uh, that's what accounts for the pleasure in looking, say, at a Robert Ryman. There's nothing there. I mean, there's a great pleasure and there's nothing there. And the blank canvas is more beautiful than anything. Oh, my picture's still up there. <laughs> what can we do? <laughs> but it doesn't have too much on there, as you can see. It's just one, two, three, four forms. It's pretty minimal itself, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> this picture's, well, it's, it's not that big, by the way. Should it stay up? <laughs> Are you tired of it? No. <laughs> what else? Yeah, well, that's from nature, to answer your question in front here. Yeah. That's from nature, and this is from my head. <laughs> well, the, you know, the uh, Terechkovich was a, uh, a little-known Russian painter in Paris, at the School of Paris. I love the stories of the School of Paris painters. He was very poor, and they said, he painted a flea, and they said, Tereshkovich, where did you get that flea? He said, out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Go ahead, should I go to call this person?
You better call people. Hi, you just said um, you can never do as, or you can almost never do as good as the first thing that you do, right? But you do go back and work on these paintings quite a bit, yes? So how do you, why do you do it when you do it, and how do you decide when you're going to do it? Well, I usually, I could be wrong about it. I mean, there's a picture at the academy uh, when you go in on the, on the ground floor, a big picture of a nude lying down with a boat and a tree. And uh, I, I painted it very quickly. I just sketched it in. And my sister-in-law came in the studio and said, don't touch it. Whatever you do, don't touch it. And I listened to her for some reason. And I had the truck come and take the picture back to New York so I didn't touch it again. But usually I'll ruin them, yeah. Why? I don't know. <laughs> Trying to make them better, of course, because you have an I idea in your head to make something great. I mean, and so you make a lot of crap. That's what happens if you overwork things. But that's it. You have to do it. I mean, I have to do it. In the front row. Towards the end, there was a, a figure on the right and a vase on the bottom, and yellow, yellow was escaping into the figure. Do, do you have, can you talk about that painting, it, how large it was, if there were it's more It's a like small it? picture. Not, not, this. not this one? I, I know the one she made, uh, yes. Keep going back. Uh, the guys. standing figure. Yeah, the little picture. Well, good, we see all these things again, that's good. There's Hartley, there's Ryder, <laughs> there they are, there's my picture. One? This one? Yeah. This It's a little tiny picture of uh, maybe, maybe, maybe this big. When what? was that? It was done outdoors, I think, uh, out on the, in the woods, on the, on the pond. My it's wife, from 89. I think it's my wife, but it could be Miranda, one of my kids. All my kids had to pose uh, <laughs> naked. Can you imagine? And some were annoyed at it, and some were okay with it. I think it's Miranda, isn't it? Huh? It's Sonia? No, it's your wife. It's not that yellow, by the way. The yellow, the, the photo does that, it makes it so yellow. It's sunlight, but not so crazy and yellow as that. I painted many pictures like, like that. We just photograph this one. Yeah. You're welcome. <coughs> well, that's it. Thank you. Okay. What, time, what time is it? <laughs>